Hello and welcome to another Dell Boy 8-Bit Years. Yes, this is just a simple set of videos um, where I remember some of the games that I played during my 8-Bit Years. Uh, and my 8-Bit Years was a sort of a very long period of time for me. It ran from around 1978 all the way up to around about 1986-87. And so I played a good amount of games during that time and had immense fun. Um, and during this series, you're, you're going to see games that I, I absolutely love. You're going to see some absolute stinkers. And there's going to be bits in between, you know, where there's something about the game that sticks out in your mind. Uh, it could be the tune, it could be the graphics, it could be something about the playability, something in between all of that. So this particular one, we're going to be talking about a platform game. Yeah, platform games uh, to a penny now. Uh, but back when this particular game came out, um, even the arcades were quite young at platform games. Uh, Donkey Kong probably being the most prominent um, and this one game that we're going to be looking at today uh, is a sequel. Yes, there was one before it. Um, I think we ought to really now start talking more about what this game is. So I'm going to switch for you to images and announce the game as Jumpman Jr. Yes, now you might be wondering, why do the sequel? Why not do the original? Is the sequel better? Um, for me... The reason um, I'm talking about the sequel more than the original is because it was the first one I played. <clears throat> Jumpman is a well-respected platform game and the first one, and it has many pluses. One of those pluses is it's got far more levels. In fact, there are 32 of them. It's got far more finesse in the graphics, i.e. they're not more comprehensive or better defined but there's more little effects that you notice, like at the end of the level, all of the level disintegrates as if it had collapsed in on itself. Little things like that. But Jumpman Jr. came about as a sequel because not many people could play Jumpman because of how many levels it was and the medium it was released on. Yes, it was a disc game. Uh, disk drives were very expensive back in the day. Um, it was totally aimed at the Atari and the Commodore 64. <laughs> and both of the dr those drives on both of those systems cost nearly as much as the computer itself. So it sold in very good numbers, but not to a mass market. Um, Epics, which was quite new at this particular stage, uh, were also not that well known for quality products. Yes, their games were functional. A lot of them that were fun, but there were things about them that didn't make them stand out <clears throat> amongst other games. Um, a perfect example of that would be Breakdance on the Commodore 64, which was incredibly blocky. Um, very simple in the fact that it was a match the dance moves in a Simon Says type kind of way. So to get this particular game out to the mass market, Epics decided to cut the levels down to 12 and stick it on cartridge and make it available on disc, which means that if you had bought the original Jumpman, you could buy the disc version of Jumpman Junior and it would be at a cheaper rate because cartridges are more expensive. So on this screen, you've got uh, the box art, a bit of a picture of the cartridge, and some more information about um, who programmed this game and who it was designed for. Yes, it was designed by a, a gentleman called Randy Glover. And Randy Glover did both Jumpman and Jumpman Jr. And his story goes back to the TRS-80, which was his first computer. And his first arcade machine that he played on while he was working was Donkey Kong. Um, he decided he wanted to do a much more free reign platform game. He wanted something where you weren't just going from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen. He wanted something more free roaming. So 
he bought a TRS-80 because it, it was quite freely available and at a slightly cheaper cost than many of the other computers were out there, um, but it didn't meet his expectations. Tried to program it. He found that there were some bricks and problems that were in the way in regards to making this a slick game. So he took his machine back, paid the extra money, bought an Atari, and so started his programming career. Because he did have a career. Um, after Jumpman and Jumpman Jr., uh, Epix put him onto the game of Summer Games, which he designed and did the music for. He also did another game called Lunar Outpost, slightly, again, different type of game. And he therefore is quite a varied programmer. After uh, Lunar Outpost and Summer Games and Jumpman, there is little known about Randy Glover, which is a shame. He does do seminars, and he's quite happy to discuss his past, which is quite varied, to be quite honest. So after um, we look at this particular image, we'll have a little look at what the game looks like. Yes, so we're going to be playing the Commodore 64 version. So on the left, I've displayed a picture that you wouldn't normally see for the majority of us, because it would be the disk loading screen. Um, this game, as I said, was designed for cartridge for the mass market. So you would only see that screen if you had the disk drive version. And then from there, you've got what the game basically looks like. You've got the middle screen, which shows little jump man walking left to right on top of a nice little rainbow bridge and some options where you can choose how many players, one to four and speed. Yes, each uh, player can have a different type of speed. One super fast, eight super slow, and everything in between. Um, basically, when I'm playing this game, I tend to put it on three. Uh, it seems to be the level that I can control the best. Um, but if you really want a challenge, put it on one. That is super fast. And basically, I find that very unwieldy. On the right, therefore, you can see the sort of platform game. Um, he's a little stick man, although quite well coloured. Um, he can move left and right, up ladders, down uh, ropes and up ropes. Uh, they are actually colour coded, the ropes, because you can only go up a certain type and down a certain type, which means there is a strategy element to this game. Um, the aim of the game is to collect the bombs. If you don't collect the bombs, basically you will die. Um, there is a time limit. Um, so we'll then move on to the different versions that this came out on. Um, so this did come out on several machines, but still not the mass market that I think Epix would have liked. So not only was it on the Commodore 64, it was on the Atari 8-bit. The Atari 8-bit, I think, moves a little bit quicker, um, although the main character is totally one colour, which is white. The ColecoVision is another quite good version. Again, the sprites are singular colour, um, but it moves at a pretty good rate and the sound isn't too bad either. Um, those were the mass market games back in 1983, but um, it was released on the 16-bit scene on the Amiga. Um, it was done by a distribution, I believe it was called Cisco. Um, however, um, it does brand the name Epix on the title screen, and they didn't have the full rights. So the game was pulled um, through the magic of emulation. We're still able to play that game, and it plays a pretty decent game. Um, it's a shame it was pulled, but unfortunately, you do need to have rights to do these games, and they got collared. Um, so we'll move to image four, and this is basically the last picture that you'll see. Um, it's basically just some reviews, and being as it's 1983, we are talking about a time where it's very difficult to find reviews of the time, but they're quite favourable. I found a nice Coleco review, which gave it 89%, um, saying that it was pretty good. 
Um, I did find another review for the Commodore 64. They really liked it, gave it quite a big write-up, but it was in a magazine that doesn't generally give it a score. So I then turned to Lemon to see what people thought of this game, and it's quite varied. Um, there are very few numbers uh, below the score of six for this game. Um, there are obviously the odd one, uh, they give their reasons for it. But I looked at that and then looked at my own gameplay and fondness of it. And I came up that this is a definitely hard 7 out of 10 for me. Um, and so I think it's best that we end it there, really, and see how bad I am 40 years later trying to play this game. Um, we'll change there for you and load up the game. Go. And there's a nice sort of like little tune. It's nothing spectacular. But you can see the options here. We've got one to four and we've got what speed we're going to be playing at. So we'll choose one player and we'll choose number three because I tend to find that's the speed that I can cope at. And you can see the very first green and it's called nothing to it. Um, I beg to differ. So there I am. Move left and right, up and down the ladders, and I can jump. Now, there is an interesting mechanic to this, in the fact that if you slightly miss the platforms, you can sort of recover. Notice that bullet. It's, an eye, it's a line of sight bullet, which means that when it finds you, you, you pretty much die. So we're going to jump over there, and you can see I just about managed to grab that. Oh. I must watch this a little bit because time is not with me. Go, go down the ladder and hopefully no magic bullet is going to come down at me. Go. If we can get the last one, and we did! There we are. Not bad at all after 40 years. My god, I surprised myself actually a little bit there. We'll see what the next level is. This is where you get some bonuses. You definitely get bonuses for the men that you survived from each level. Ah, this one's called Fire Fire. This one's got an interesting mechanic. Not only do you have now the bullet, but what happens is if you pr pick up the bomb, fire arrives, and they're stuck there. They don't move. And they keep they change position every time you pick up a bomb. Oh, so that one we worked out quite lucky. Bullet, we better get rid of that. You just got to really remember to stop when you pick up the bomb because otherwise you can really become a cropper. Damn, I was just about to be able to jump straight up, but I couldn't. Game. Life gone. Oh. Oh. And there we are, I touched the flames. Damn. You must remember to stop. And I must remember to do that. My god. We're badly here. Uh, where are we going to do this? I think we have to go across here. And across here. It's a much better way of doing this. Oh my god. There's the flames again. few more to get. Hopefully the bullet won't get me. There it is. Remember to stop when you pick up the flames. Oh, that worked out bad. Get this one. There we go. Jump over that. Ah, I landed on the rope. 
And because the rope put me higher than uh, two men high, I died. Damn. So we're not doing too great here, but we've got one to get. Get it. Yay! So we're on to level three. Remember, there are 12 levels. And so far, I'm not doing great. I've got two men left. And this one is called Shredle. Ah, ladders backwards. Yes, and this one's got ladders. I remember this one. The worst thing about this one is the bullets. You've got to jump onto the ladders and run with them. Oh. Stop. Like that. Oh. You fall off. <laughs> I love the way he dies. He sort of tumbles down. It's brilliant. I do like that. Got that. Keep going with the ladders. Well, maybe the bullet's not on this one. I thought it was. Just follow the ladder up and then do a little wiggle. You should be fine. Might as well get that one on the far left. Out the way. And then repeat on to this side. Oh. Notice how I just got there. You can grab hold of him uh, off of it. The, I believe the programmer explained that he did a sprite. Ah, oh, damn, I died. A sprite underneath the man. And there is a detection where you can, where if you're slightly above, in the middle of the platforms, um, he will climb himself slightly up so that you're ba level back up. We didn't do too badly there. So we'll put my name in. And I'm just going to quickly show what fast looks like. Because <laughs> I find it totally unwieldy. But I think it's a, a worthy challenge for anybody to have a go on this one. So we'll do a one player again and choose the fastest speed. And we're back to the beginning. Go. Nope. Can't manage to just about do that. Ah. Oh. I forgot there's a hole when you pick up that one. <laughs> oh. See, as soon as I touch the bomb, you have to stop, but it's going so fast. It's almost like inertia. You just die. Go. Oh. Just missed that. <laughs> that tune will get irritated very quickly. Oh, no. <laughs> that, that made me jump. And it is called Jump Man. Oh. Oh. Honestly, all you got to do is a gentle push, otherwise, you just die. 900, what a score. I think we'll end it there. We'll uh, go back to my camera view and just do a sort of a summary. I've got very fond memories of Jumpman Jr. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that if you have a choice between playing the game, Jumpman is the one to play. But that's enough, taking nothing away from Jumpman Jr. because there are some new mechanics in this. You saw that there were flames um, there are some other things other than the magic bullet that on line of sight hits you. There are some multiple bullets. Um, there is, uh, on one of the levels, a wind factor where um, you jump into the wind and you won't quite make the platform because the wind pushes you away. And there are electrified, plat electrified platforms. So I'm going to round up by saying 
I had a great time with this game, and later on, I got a greater affection for Jumpman. But this is definitely one still worth a play today. With that, I'm going to say salute. I hope that gives you encouragement to try some new games and continue to watch my 8-bit years. Till the next time, bye-bye.